Hello everyone and happy International Women's Day. Welcome to this panel discussion about strengthening peace in the Nuri region. My name is Timo Hissila. I'm a passionate follower of debate and opinions on international relations. I'm particularly interested in how prejudices and beliefs that enable violence are constructed and how they can be acted upon to reduce violence. Here I'm acting as a volunteer journalist cooperating with presence. The Nordic region, along with Europe and the entire world, has recently experienced numerous complex developments whose impacts on the security of the region is not clear. At the same time, we realize the vital importance of preventing the illegitimate use of military force and warfare and strengthening the conditions for stable and sustainable peace. Through this discussion, we are aiming to identify and clarify opportunities that should be seized to strengthen peace in the region. And more specifically, what the states in the region should and should not do, and what ordinary people can do. Our distinguished panelists are Thomas Jonter, Professor of International Relations at the Department of Economic History and International Relations, Stockholm University, and Visiting Professor at the Alva Myrdal Center, Uppsala University. He has a PhD in history from Uppsala University and a degree in organizational leadership from the University of Oxford. Junter was the head of the Department of Economic History and International Relations from 2006 to 2009 and 2016 to 2020, and was director of the Stockholm University Graduate School of International Studies 2013 to 2016. Since 2024, he has been leading the Nuclear Disarmament and Non-Proliferation Working Group at the Alba Muda Center. Dr. Jonter has also been a visiting researcher at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, Stanford University, and Cornell University. Uh, since 2015, he has been the chair of the Swedish Bukvash Group. Dr. Nikolai Sukov, a senior fellow at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation, he is a former arms control negotiator for Soviet and later Russian a foreign ministry and has participated in INF, START I and START II negotiations, as well as multiple ministerial and summit meetings. He holds two PhDs from the University of Michigan and from the Institute of World Economy and International Relations, Russian Academy of Sciences. Dr. Sokov has published widely including two dozen books and monographs, as well as more than 200 articles. Perki Tuomioja retired from Finnish parliament a year ago, having first been elected 1970 and having served for 11 years as Minister for Foreign Affairs. He is also a historian and chairman of the NGO Historians Without Borders, which he founded in 2015. He is an active member of the Finnish peace movement and has served as the chair of the committee of 100 and editor of its magazine UDI. I'd like to thank Presenza International Press Agency for providing the opportunity and the necessary tools for this discussion. Presenza is a space open to the expression of the social base. It consists of Volunteers with extensive experience in communication, social activism, cultural and academic fields. The agency is independent from any economic interest, basic condition for its autonomy. If you have questions for our panelists, please send them in the Q&A. A few questions may be taken up for the panelists to discuss later. Let me go through the plan for our discuss. To begin with, we are going to watch a short video clip in which Johan Kaltung, often called 
Morente, founder of Moren Peace Studies, will describe his formula for peace. Each panelist will then explain where they see the greatest opportunities to strengthen peace in the region, and we'll discuss this together. Following this, we can delve deeper into the states of the region and their capabilities, what they should and should not do. Then we'll move on to discuss civil society. Are citizens well informed? Can they effectively influence this process? What can ordinary people do? After these possible questions from the audience can be brought into the discussion. Finally, the panelists will summarize the key insights produced by this discuss. The video you are about to see is a cut from a lecture by Johan Kalkbom on 21st April 2016 at the University of Antwerp, Belgium. It's, if you will, a very short formulation of about 60 years' work. It's a formula for peace. Four tasks. Equity multiplied by empathy, positive. Divided by the threats to peace, trauma multiplied by conflict. Let me define the four. And definitions must be taken seriously. Equity means cooperation for mutual and equal benefit. Don't just say cooperation, the point is equal benefit. Empathy is related to harmony. Empathy meaning understanding the other as the other as other understands him and herself. It does not mean agreeing or disagreeing, sympathy or antipathy. It simply means being inside the other. There is a particular profession that is a specialist on this. The actors. The actors have to be that person. Now, this is essential for harmony. What is harmony? Harmony is feeling sorrow when other is sorrow. Feeling the joy of other as a joy. Sharing sorrow, sharing joy emotional resonance. If you have a little bit too little of one of them, you can compensate by more on the other, hence the multiplication sign. Sounds good. But there are two things lurking in the denominator of the fraction. Unreconciled trauma and unsolved conflict. Now, trauma are the residues of the violence of the past. Conflict is not violence, but could lead to it. Conflict means incompatibility. You want something, I also want something. It's incompatible. The point about creativity is to say, is there something we can do with the context, bringing in some aspects of a new reality so that the goals become compatible? So now I have tried to explain what these four terms stand for. Thank you, Johan. Rest in peace. And peace is what we are going to talk about today. Let's start with the first question. If our panelists could each give a brief answer to this, and then we could discuss these ideas together. When we talk about the Nordic countries and their surroundings, where do you see the greatest opportunities to strengthen the conditions 
for stable and sustainable peace. Could I direct this question first to Thomas, and then Erkki, and then Nikolai? Please, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Timo. Timo. Uh, first of all, I think it's a, a very complex question, and it has many layers uh, uh, how we can reach a situation where we can be able to talk about the sustainable peace. Uh, but before I go into that, I want to give here the background uh, of the situation we are facing here in the Baltic Sea region, especially from a Swedish point of view, and also, uh, I would say, a Finnish point of view, even if Erki will tell us more about it. I mean, uh, from uh, the Swedish point of view, and also the Finnish, uh, what happened after the Cold War that uh, meant that we together in Europe, uh, in a consensus uh, cooperation with Russia, we built a, a new uh, security architecture, a rule-based international system, uh, meaning that we should respect each other, um, uh, based on human rights, uh, sovereign right to, to decide on the foreign policy and security policy course. And um, that was the kind of entrance for the Swedish point of view. So we scaled down the defense uh, system in Sweden dramatically and so on and so forth. And today we hardly have any defense whatsoever. No, I'm exaggerating a bit, but it was uh, it is not as strong as it used to be during the Cold War. Okay, but what happened in 2014 with the Russian annexation of Crimea, and of course the Russian attack in uh, Ukraine in February uh, 2022 kind of changed that. Uh, and uh, in the eyes of Sweden, uh, it, uh, Russia destroyed this understanding rule-based order, and it forced us to join NATO. So what can we do in order to reach that kind of more peaceful situation? But in the short term, uh, I think uh, it's taken for granted from all the Nordic states, including Finland and Sweden, that uh, it, it has to be more a kind of focus on deterrence to develop the defense, national defense, and coordinate uh, the defense capabilities in the Nordic regions. Uh, having said that, uh, if I focus on the deterrence, you can do that in different ways. And here I think there are certain elements that, it's, that are unique here from a Nordic point of view, and especially from a Swedish point of view, I would say. And that is that we have a, a, a very a good track record of promoting peace, peace building, uh, disarmament and things like that. And we have seen that in the process to join NATO, both in Finland and in Sweden, that we send the signals, there will, will be no nuclear weapons on Swedish, and as far as I understand, uh, on, on Finnish uh, territory. Uh, no foreign uh, bases, uh, military bases in Sweden, uh, we will take care of that ourselves. That is to send the signals that uh, in the long run, we are uh, willing to find a way where we can have a dialogue over the, the, the Baltic Sea with Russia and other states in order to find a situation where we could sit down, negotiate, understand, and not focus too much on uh, building up uh, non-trust and uh, increase the tensions. Uh, I would say, and when we when we are there, and it will take uh, at least uh, a couple of years. Having said that, we don't know what happens two years from now. Then it will be possible to go back to the past that we have here as a Nordic experience, and I'm not only talking about Norway and Sweden. Then even so, sorry, Finland and Sweden, uh, Norway and Denmark also has a certain past when promoting peace, uh, finding ways to have a dialogue. Uh, so I, I think that is uh, key to understand uh, the general background before we can go deeper into this issue. Thank you. I think I'll stop here. Okay, thank you. And then Eric. 
Well, thank you. Um, first of all, the Nordic countries are known uh, in the world as uh, oases of stability, democracy, and uh, well-functioning welfare states with a low degree of corruption, efficient governance, etc. That means that uh, inside, uh, in interior to the Nordic region, there are no uh, particular threats to peace. Uh, on the contrary, the Nordic countries stand out as uh, reasonable uh, countries which uh, uh, could, uh, and following that example, would be beneficial for most of us. But the Nordic countries are not, of course, living in isolation from the rest of the world. On the contrary, we are open, trade-wise open uh, economies, dependent on uh, globalization, on which we have, uh, out of which we have done rather well, actually. Uh, and uh, that means that uh, ongoing war and conflict uh, in Ukraine, in uh, the Middle East and elsewhere, also affects the Nordic countries. So we are not living in isolation uh, at all from the rest of the world. And um, uh, we have had a history of uh, uh, contributing to uh, security, not as consumers of uh, security, uh, rather than producers of security. Our participation in, in uh, United Nations and other uh, peacekeeping operations, uh, our activities in uh, 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 promoting uh, disarmament and arms control measures is known. Uh, and this is something which should continue and must continue also in the new situation where uh, both all of the five Nordic countries will be NATO countries. Um, Thomas gave a picture of uh, Sweden and referred also to Finland. Um, I'm not quite sure that uh, I can be so complacent about the Finnish situation, because there have been uh, quite prominent people who have been saying that we should uh, uh, grab the other legislation which prohibits the importation or, uh, in, uh, of any nuclear weapons into the country. And uh, this will be an open issue, which will be also discussed, debated, and decided in Parliament. I myself, of course, will turn out from the point of uh, from the point that there should be and must be no change in this. And by the way, even if it were there were to be scrapped this uh, prohibition, I don't see anyone, one, not even the U.S., has any interest in importing uh, nuclear weapons um, into Finland or any of the Nordic countries. But still, I think that the prohibition, making it clear that we are a non-nuclear country, I wish to say that way. Uh, has to be uh, important. And I would even go uh, further uh, on this road and say that uh, Finland and indeed all the Nordic countries could and should join the International um, uh, Nuclear Ban uh, Treaty, which has come into force. It will not take away any nuclear weapons as long as the nuclear countries are not in it. But uh, uh, I think this is an important uh, 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 thing which uh, important step we should uh, and could uh, take um, to uh, underline our uh, revulsion versus nuclear weapons as a threat to humanity uh, and the future of mankind as a whole. And um, this has been rather watered down in the discussion. I hope that Sweden uh, will keep its non nuclear stance. But I have also noted that in Sweden there is some sort of discussion ongoing uh, about uh, about that. Uh, and uh, all of us are also, uh, the Nordic countries um, uh, have signed uh, defense cooperation agreements with the United States, which will not bring any permanent foreign bases into our countries, but will open the door for uh, an American military presence in parts of our uh, countries. And this is also an issue which will be debated in, in, in Finland and look uh, very critically uh, what, what what we can and uh, could accept and, and where to draw the line. But the point is that, uh, the general point is that the Nordic countries as such are producers of uh, security and producers of uh, uh, measures uh, enhancing peace and stability in the world. 
and we must continue to have this role also in the future. And being a NATO member, as the example of Norway has shown, is no hindrance uh, to acting uh, in this manner. Thank you. Thank you, Erki. And then Nikolai. Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, let me actually go back uh, to Thomas, uh, what he started uh, to talk about. Uh, oh, so yes, just uh, the point preliminary kind of notes. Uh, so yes, I was asked to pray, uh, to present the Russian point of view here. Uh, well, for a Russian point of view, you really need to invite someone from Russia. <laughs> so I'm basically in Vienna, so I'm presenting my understanding of, of the Russian perspective. I hope it's very accurate, it's although also critical. Um, uh, but so let's go back uh, to what Thomas actually started with. Uh, he said that we built with a wonderful old international kind of system there. Uh, for the entire Europe, it's based on rules and human rights and all the nice things. Now, I would say that from the Russian point of view, that did not happen. Uh, uh, basically, uh, the idea uh, that existed at the end of the Cold War about the common security space of, from Lisbon to Vladivostok, based on the OCE, as the organization, the platform to make the rules, so the United Nations, the United Nations system for Europe, based on Paris Charter, uh, did not survive long after the end of the Cold War. So he said, Russia, uh, usually NATO enlargement and the European Union enlargement is seen, you know, in terms of military balance. Uh, that's uh, the typical, very standard, very traditional, I would say, uh, both cultural and historic, actually, traits of Russian foreign policy. If that's, of course, wrong, that's, uh, that's a mistake, is that NATO was not a military threat to Russia. Uh, uh, but what actually happened was that with more and more countries joining NATO and the European Union, uh, the decision-making mechanism uh, began to center in these organizations of, of for a more global kind of perspective, also throwing G7. So when we talk about the rules-based world, that's a very, I think, misleading concept. Uh, because it does sound like we live according to the rules, yes, and or well, the rest of the world is completely lawless, yes, it doesn't follow any rules. That's actually not true. Uh, the trick is that we in the West were making the rules and interpreting the rules. Uh, yes, and we are good people. So and we make wonderful decisions. So all the rest are supposed to follow the rules that we make and decisions that we make just because we're so good. And if we don't follow these rules, well, they must be bad. Something wrong about them. Uh, Thomas uh, talked about annexation of Crimea. Yeah, that's not nice annexation of Crimea. Um, he forgot to mention, for example, uh, that it was uh, the two-stage process. Yes, and then the first stage, actually, Crimea became independent of, from Ukraine. So everyone completely disapproved of that. So you, oh, that's wrong. Uh, so it also violates all the laws, well, including the laws of Ukraine. But we did accept independence of Kosovo. We simply made a rule of, uh, that Kosovo independence is an exception. Um, and should not serve as a precedent. So we make that rule, everyone is supposed to follow that rule. So the application of the rule is ours. Uh, so that's why, so that's basically the situation why the OEC 
started to lose any kind of relevance. Because the large group of European states were coming out to Vienna, to the OEC, uh, with a decision already made. Oops. Uh, some states outside NATO and the European Union um, indeed were ready to follow on uh, these decisions. Uh, some uh, did not agree. It's actually Russia did not quite always disagree. So uh, some kind of commonality or you know, some joint decision making uh, did take place, but paths continued you know, to go apart. Uh, so yeah, I really see you know, uh, the roots of the situation in that. Yes, I would also like to note that in 2002, there was a Rome summit between NATO and Russia. Yes, and there was uh, the NATO-Russian Council established. Oh, at the time, I actually thought it was a great idea uh, because it allowed Russia a voice but not a vote. So at least participate in the discussion. Sometimes uh, disagreements are not big, or uh, sometimes they might be important for Russia, completely unimportant or uh, to NATO, uh, but this contribute kind of to the development of the decision. And yes, no right or veto. Uh, that concept of the NATO Russia Council died only a few years later with the second wave of enlargement of NATO. Why I talk about the second wave, not the first wave? Because the first wave very deliberately missed the Russia angle. And the second wave that was conducted out on the platform of the need to deter us. So, in direct response uh, now to the question, uh, well, it depends on how we define peace. Yes. If we define it the way we had before 22, no, we won't have it for a long time. Yes, I would not say a couple of years, I say uh, 10, 15, 20 years. It's a new Cold War, it's been going there for a long time. Yes, if we talk about uh, peace as the actions of war, likely we'll have it. It'll be conflict, it's a new Cold War, and we can actually make it stable and reasonably safe. Uh, so, also, so, and that's uh, basically my short answer to the question you asked. Cool, thank you, Nikolai. And uh, Thomas, would you like to comment on these views? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, First, uh, Erki, uh, yeah, I fully agree with you that uh, the situation regarding nuclear weapons is still an open uh, question, uh, both in Finland and in, in Sweden. And you are absolutely right. There is no demands from the American side to place nuclear weapons on Swedish soil or Finnish soil as what we can understand uh, for what will happen in the near future. Um, but it... From the Swedish point of view, it has been very important to send that signal because we uh, came out from a situation uh, in the mid, uh, middle of the Cold War when we had a very serious nuclear weapons program. And in 1968, the Swedish parliament said no to nuclear weapons. And since then, it's been a consensus in Sweden that um, uh, Sweden's... Uh, um, view on nuclear weapons should be focused on disarmament and take lead in different ways to um, promote uh, non-proliferation and, and things like that. So both uh, the social democratic government that uh, was in power uh, in 2022 and the present liberal conservative government has stated uh, it will be no nuclear weapons in peacetime in Sweden. So it's a send a signal, uh, absolutely. Uh, having said that, of course, uh, the um, negotiation will start soon, especially for Sweden. I guess it has already, the process has already started in Finland, how to integrate Finland into the kind of NATO framework. But for Sweden, it will soon start. And th there are certain 
key uh, issues that are very important given the Swedish past, uh, and disarmament is one of them. And I fully agree that uh, disarmament policy is still an option as a member of NATO, even though, of course, the kind of uh, um, uh, the, the, the rule for maneuver are uh, limited uh, if you compare how it was 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And then, Nikolai, uh, absolutely, I understand there are different views on this, and you don't represent Russia. I'm not representing Sweden either. I, I just try to give the Swedish perspective here. Uh, the way Sweden have kind of, irrespective of government, uh, social, social democratic or conservative labor government, how it was explained uh, during 2022 and 2023 that led to the process first to uh, seek a membership, and, and then now we are a full member. Uh, that the kind of rationale for um, heading in this direction and, and things like that. And I think you point to something that we... Uh, should also try to discuss here. Uh, perception is one thing, ob objective factors, what happened, historical facts and things like that is one thing, but it's also about perception, different interpretation of what happened. And I think that's so important if you want to find a way to sit down uh, and discuss uh, different uh, initiatives in, in the field of uh, decreasing tensions and things like that. So I, I, uh, I think, uh, and Nikolai, I think you're absolutely right. I don't see uh, whatever, however we define peace, uh, that we will have a, 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 a nice and robust, peaceful situation where we have a fruitful discussion for years. I wouldn't say 10, 15 years. I, I'm a little bit more optimistic. I think when we the, the pattern has been laid uh, where Russians know what they have, Sweden and Finland, and what the NATO enlargement means, I think there is a, 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 a ground for further and maybe more fruitful, hopefully at least, discussions. Uh, but we're not there, and we don't know what will happen. Uh, we, 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 we don't have a crystal uh, bold to look into the future. Uh, but I think there, there are um, certainly uh, good good reasons to believe that we can reach there. Uh, but then we, we need to be more open for dialogues and understand there are different perceptions going on here in inter interpreting the situation. Good. Thank you. Erki, would you like to comment this opinion? Sam. Well, uh, Finland's, uh, like Sweden's accession to NATO, is a defensive reaction. Uh, we have no offensive plans, and uh, I discount the idea that uh, NATO could ever uh, actually attack Russia or anyone else. It is both incapable and unwilling to do so. But uh, I understand that there are historical reasons for this kind of fear, uh, which is also being spread for uh, political ideological reasons uh, uh, creating that it is a reality. And I have said that never, one for once, never underestimate the degree of paranoia that affects uh, international relations and also particularly uh, Russia with its long memories of uh, Charles XII, uh, Napoleon and Hitler and so on. Uh, but we are living in a different world and, and nobody is capable of uh, doing that. So it has been a defensive reaction uh, from our side, and we want to keep it uh, very clearly uh, that way. Uh, and I would also like to comment when Nikolai presented, said that the rules-based, or, or gave the impression that the rules-based order uh, and that the, uh, have been drawn up by the West. Uh, I don't think we are interested in Western values. When we talk about uh, the rule of law, uh, democracy, respect for human rights. These are not Western values. These are universal values. And I r would point out that they are enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations, which has been accepted uh, by all the 193 member states of the United Nations. Likewise, the uh, Declaration of Human Rights passed in 1948 is a universal declaration of human rights. 
uh, and nobody uh, voted against it uh, when it was uh, adopted. Good, thank you. Nikolai, would you like to briefly? I hope, uh, oh, Thomas, uh, that you're right with your optimism and it will take less time you know, to build at least some kind of bridges. Uh, oh, then personally, uh, quite pessimistic is I can see some risk reduction, uh, but probably uh, nowhere near the return of going back. But can, can, but, but just can we do something to build bridges? Uh, I don't think we can do anything in the near future. Okay. Uh, the Iron Curtain is there. Uh, which I think we live in a systemic really conflict about the key question is who is making the rules. Uh, as I already said, um, um, I think the Russian kind of perception uh, about the military balance and military threat from Navy, as I fully actually agree, uh, that's completely kind of wrong. Uh, but that's how in Russia they actually interpreted the fact that they were outside decision-making. I'm not talking about the big, broad kind of things. Human rights is wonderful. I'm talking more about simple, well, you know, daily kind of business of international relations. Uh, some countries might say, actually, no, we don't like that decision. Also, in the group tries to accommodate them. So other countries say, no, we don't like that decision. Yes, and you hear, well, uh, well, you know, it's really the best decision. It's for the best of everyone. It's wonderful and so forth. Also, uh, when we keep, uh, keep having the same kind of situation, yes, it does create conflict. Uh, now, uh, things would have been simple, uh, we're not really difficult, had it just been Russia. But the same actually views are shared by also China, India. Um, and India might be in conflict with China, but if you look at what the Indian leaders actually say about the international system and decision-making, it's the same views. And the entire BRICS. Uh, so it's not uh, just you know like an outlier that's actually Russia. Uh, well, it's a lot of actually countries. Uh, so that's why I say the conflict is systemic. And finally, uh, about UN Charter, it's not a question to you. Um, it's rhetorical, it's a question. But can someone point, uh, point to me if, if it's legal uh, to invade another country? I would say that it's completely illegal. Mm -hmm. As long as we define the target country as bad, not legal, if we define it as good. So the problem that Russia is actually facing right now, and why it's so indignant, is that the invasion of Ukraine, it's like all an invasion, it's not special military operation, is that it's the fourth violation of UN Charter. And the first three were committed, I'm sorry, by the United States. I'm a citizen of the United States, but nonetheless, it was committed by the United States. Sorry about that. Brief comments from Thomas and Eric. Regarding, okay, uh, the UN Charter, I don't want to go into, I think I leave that question to Eric, and because he, he kind of raised that uh, issue. But I uh, will at least try to kind of give my reasons why I am a little bit more optimistic than Nikolai in terms of, uh, I don't think we have to wait, hopefully, uh, 10, 15, 20 years before the situation might be better. Uh, because it depends what you mean with success. Uh, and I'm uh, maybe then optimistic, but I'm not as optimistic as Erki that believe and argue that uh, signing of the Treaty of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is something that we uh, can see. But maybe I exaggerate here what you said, but uh, I don't see that will happen, uh, in, not in Finland and not in, not in, not in Sweden, 
Uh, I think that's uh, out of question for many years, as I see it. So for me, the perspective today is, first of all, do everything possible to try to get United States and Russia to sit down at the negotiation table to stabilize the situation, to talk to each other, have some kind of dialogue. Uh, and as it looks right now, United States and Russia are not able to do that themselves. So they need some kind of push and help and assistance from other countries. And here I think, in fact, that the Nordic countries can play a role with okay. uh, the, the background of uh, peace brokers, and especially Sweden, with its special focus on disarmament. And we have uh, the, the Stockholm Initiative that was launched, um, I think it was 2019, 16 states, both uh, NATO states and non-NATO states came together to discuss different initiatives to kind of uh, find a way for Russia and United States to sit down. Uh, to minimize the risks, uh, kind of uh, uh, hotline initiatives, uh, to kind of uh, degrees the tensions. I think we are here. We are at this stage. We, 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 we. And for me, that is what we have to focus on now, to create the best condition to start this dialogue. And then we will see we, what we can do going from there. Uh, so, so that's the reason why I'm, uh, I would say, more optimistic. But that could be viewed not too optimistic by others, of course. But that's the way I see it. Um, uh, but on, on the other hand, but we see here with the NATO enlargement, the focus in Sweden, uh, in most NATO states, is on scaling up the defense system. We abandoned the conscription's army. Uh, 15 years ago in Sweden, and now it's back again, and we try to um, kind of develop the, the, the defense capability. So at this moment, uh, especially from 20, the spring 2022 until the process of becoming a, mem a NATO member, full member, uh, it has been very difficult to come up with these initiatives, the Stockholm initiative, ideas and things like that. Now, but now, uh, when we are member, I do believe there is another room for maneuver here, uh, if we act in a very fruitful and productive way, I think. Having said that, of course, it depends on how Russia and United States uh, treated uh, these initiatives. I think they are in their interest, but they're also uh, a kind of interplay uh, a game between these two uh, um, uh, parties, uh, uh, countries that has its own, has its own dynamic that could, from time to time, be very uh, difficult to understand and influence in a more positive way. Good, thank you. And Erki, in few words, your thoughts. Well, uh, whether a Stockholm initiative or any other initiative taken by the Nordic countries leads anywhere will depend on also on Russia and the United States. But uh, first, we have to have the internal will in our countries to continue with this uh, kind of uh, uh, peace building uh, and uh, uh, trust building measures. Uh, and uh, I, uh, unfortunately, I see some lack of that, uh, at least in Finland and hopefully not in Sweden. Good, good, for, good for Sweden. Um, and I did not refer to the total nuclear uh, weapons ban treaty as, as something which I expect to be signed. And it will be it will only as meant as a signal, uh, because, will, as I said, it will not remove a single uh, nuclear weapon as uh, long as the nuclear weapon states are not involved. But it will give an important signal, and it will also uh, signal that we do not accept uh, nuclear weapons um, uh, as uh, a uh, permanent uh, feature of our security because there are three uh, fundamental uh, threats to mankind, and they are nuclear weapons, climate change, and the loss of biodiversity. And uh, in the present, as long as the present situation with ongoing conflicts 
and no uh, direct negotiations between the parties continues, it will also mean that uh, there can be there will be little progress, if any, uh, on this uh, combating this uh, <coughs> fundamental fun fundamental threat. And that's why why I'm also concerned and not so optimistic because if we wait 15 years to do to start combating climate change and loss of biodiversity, everything may be lost by that time. We don't know, but I'm very concerned about that. Uh, so um, uh, these are some of the points I, I uh, wish to uh, to make at this point. And then regarding, the, of course, we all want to see the United States and Russia engage seriously with each other. But I would also like to add that they cannot decide on behalf of the Ukrainians or the Palestinians or the Israelis, uh, for that matter, uh, what, to, what will happen in these questions. So, yes, they have to be involved, but they cannot be, they cannot even bilaterally impose any solutions on other people without their consent. Okay, thank you very much. Interesting uh, uh, discussion, but we need to uh, go uh, forward. I would like to um, ask a second question. What kind of power and ability do the states in the region have to effectively strengthen peace? What kind of vulnerabilities exist in the different states? And what actions should states actually take? Who would like to start with this? Eric. If I can say very briefly, it's, it's, uh, we, uh, we have soft power. We don't have uh, military power, uh, and we have relatively little economic power. We do have that, uh, actually, to some extent. And uh, I think that we must deploy our resources effectively as Norway has done, unfortunately, Finland is cutting down on its uh, defense, co on its um, development cooperation measures, and consequently means that we will have less co uh, power to contribute to uh, solving uh, conflicts. But uh, this is the kind of soft power because the Nordic countries do not, nobody suspects us of our, having our own uh, agenda or interest, which would be in conflict with uh, any, anyone uh, engaged in a conflict. So we are seen as uh, impartial and reliable in that context. So this is the you know, what the Nordic contribution can and should be uh, towards peace building. Good, thank you. And uh, Thomas or Nicola, Nicola, please. Oh, I can go. Um, okay. Oh, thank you. Should I? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, we don't have a strong defense uh, in Sweden either. I think the Finnish defense is much stronger than what we have in Sweden today. Uh, we are not a uh, super strong economic power, uh, but we have uh, some unique kind of uh, uh, ingredients uh, that I think we could use uh, better, and I hope we will do that. And I have referred to some of them already. We have this... Uh, past, uh, I mean, started after the Second World War, during the Cold War, uh, this disarmament uh, policy, a kind, um, kind of uh, acting as peace uh, broker. Uh, so diplomacy, I think we have a, a strong legacy in diplomacy that could be used uh, in many respects. Um, having said that, uh, you could argue uh, over the last 10, 15 years, we haven't seen Sweden so much engage in, in disarmament issues as we were used to see if we go back 20, 25 years in time, and especially uh, during the Cold War. Uh, but it's still there. Uh, it's still there. And I think the, uh, when we become now a, a member of NATO, there will be uh, um, a will, I hope, but Eric, absolutely on your side there. It has to be a more kind of outspoken political will that kind of prioritize this area. This is what we want to do. We haven't seen that. But I think and I hope that even the present government, uh, conservative uh, liberal government, will go back to the Stockholm Initiative uh, and with the intention that here they know not only Sweden, the Nordic countries can play a role. And you, you should also remember that 
what we see here, uh, for the first time since the Union of Kalmar 500 years ago, there is a common uh, security policy in the Nordic countries now. And it will be, or could be, a, a, a power factor in NATO uh, that we, if we play the cards uh, right, uh, we could also um, kind of influence other states within NATO and not just follow what the other states or United States uh, have for uh, goals for what should happen in the near future and so on and so forth. So I think uh, there are uh, possibilities to do something positive here. Uh, absolutely. Great. Thank you. And Nikolai, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would say that we are all, all on both sides of the Iron Curtain, the new Iron Curtain, are in the phase of building defense capability. It's NATO first and foremost, because yes, really NATO is militarily quite weak. All of this, and Russia seemed strong, but well, also on the one hand, during the ongoing war, it demonstrated that it's not as strong as it thought and others thought. Uh, plus, it has, it has expended all the resources. Uh, so there will be a build-up uh, on both sides. And I'm afraid that we'll only be able uh, to go back to some kind of degree of cooperation uh, to start building a new security system arrangements in Europe only after kind of things kind of settled down uh, and then both sides are more or less kind of satisfied with the level of you know, military security. Uh, that said, we need to be able to live through uh, that period so that we do not have to relearn uh, in a hard way or uh, the same lessons of, of, of that we learned from the first half of the Cold War through multiple kind of crises that almost kind of resulted in uh, a big war. Uh, so I would say uh, the first task here is not oh, in fact, doing something about nuclear weapons, although that would be nice. Uh, but even like as a US citizen, I would not actually advocate it at this moment. But unfortunately, I spent my whole life trying to do something about nuclear weapons. It's a hand in my hand in very deep reductions. Uh, all, all the things that I've done in my life, uh, well, basically, my last kind of business, well, I'm now see what flying out of the window. It's a very sad feeling. Uh, but I will say that we should try to avoid kind of crisis. So the first thing I would advise is being cautious and being prudent and not create a crisis where one should not actually have. Uh, that does apply a lot uh, to Nordic states uh, because or an attempt to close down the Baltic Sea to Russia or to isolate and neutralize, as some say, Kaliningrad Oblast really creates the West Berlin crisis in reverse, yes, and I would like to see that at the void. Uh, if I think we can leave through the next several years without a major crisis, then we can start actually moving to something a little bit more ambitious. Uh, so, so I would be very, very concerned about crisis stability in the coming several years. Oh, but that we can do. And here, I would say that Nordic countries with very, very long history, I fully agree, with a very long history of, of peace efforts can do a lot. We missed an opportunity. We may have another opportunity, but to have the second opportunity, we do need to be uh, cautious and rational and prudent. Uh, a small maybe steps, uh, but keep kind of working. Uh, so yes, I would maybe 
I'll de-emphasize for a limited time the arms control agenda on nuclear weapons. Uh, although, once again, yes, I've done that my whole life. It's really sad that I have to say that. Yes, and I'll, I'll then try to focus on crisis stability at the moment, especially in the North, especially. Okay. Thank you, Nikolai. And Erki, would you like to give comments in view, or should we proceed? Well, just to pick up the last point, uh, as long as there is a war going on in Ukraine, uh, I don't see any possibilities for real arms control or disarmament measures. So that has to be our prime concern. But we have to prepare for the to, to time when it becomes possible to re-engage in serious arms control and disarmament uh, negotiations. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we need to proceed uh, again. And oh, sorry. To... Okay, uh, please continue. A two finger. Um, uh, I just wanted to fully support that at a point of view and wanted to share that. That view is actually widely shared in NATO and um, for our center, Central Non Proliferation Studies, uh, uh, the Vienna Center, we do actually a capacity building effort for NATO on, on arms control. So, yes, the need kind of to prepare for the right moment in the future, I think, is widely shared. That's good. Good. Thank you. Then we will uh, move forward. And uh... I would like to ask you, how do you see the role of civil society? Are citizens well informed and can they effectively influence the process of strengthening peace? What can ordinary people do to strengthen peace in this region? Who would like to start? Herk. I can start and say that the Nordic countries are known for their vibrant civil society and the importance of civil society uh, in politics. Uh, there has been a change in the past two decades. Uh, parties still continue to play a role, and they need to play a role because there's no parliamentary democracy without political parties, but they are no longer have any monopoly uh, on uh, uh, politics and influence. Uh, so we have seen an increase, actually, in civil society uh, influence, and that goes for all the Nordic countries. But we have a problem, uh, that is the problem with uh, Russia, because uh, free civil society in Russia is no longer able to work. Uh, and I think that uh, we have made mistakes in, in closing our our relations with academic institutions in, in Russia. Uh, if there if is even a slight chance, possibility, for engaging with um, people in Russia on a free uh, basis and civil society, we should do so. So we shouldn't, uh, I would say, we shouldn't do the work of Putin, who wants to restrict civil society. We should uh, try to engage with civil society in Russia as difficult as th this is today. Yeah, I, I, agree. I, I agree with Erki that civil uh, society, and I would also say uh, independent research uh, in security issues have been very important in all Nordic countries. And um, uh, I can give you a couple of examples, the way the civil society and research uh, played in Sweden. In 1966, CIPRI was established to do research uh, in order to help and assist the government with new knowledge, new, new perspectives in relation to disarmament and foreign policy decision making and so on and so forth. And a couple of years ago, Alva Myrdal Center of Disarmament was established at the Uppsala universities. And we have an old tradition that we called in Swedish for for Kofferschar. Uh, people and defense or something like that. It's a kind of forum where uh, experts, military, politicians, and ordinary uh, citizens come together and discuss uh, security issues. And it has been a very strong and important uh, uh, tradition in Sweden. Having said that, I have to be a little bit critical to what's going on 
in Sweden right now, because the present government uh, kind of uh, abandoned, uh, stopped all funding to peace organizations and other organizations dealing with peace initiatives. Probably, I don't know, but probably it has to do with the NATO membership process. It's been so sensitive for the government, especially when Erdogan and Turkey took us on trips. Uh, that kind of um, it was very complicated for us. Uh, so it's not only in Russia some, <laughs> that bad things uh, in civil societies uh, and the decreasing role of the civil society uh, is happening. Having said that, of course, there are still strong uh, peace organizations and, and civil societies in, in Sweden. But um, I think it could play a more important role because I'm a little bit afraid, to be honest here, that the, as I see, very good tradition to base decisions include a broad uh, spectrum of organization and uh, ordinary citizens in, in discussing this issue can be lost uh, with the membership of NATO, because now we see a tendency that only experts know what's to be done. No, it's too sensitive for ordinary people to deal with these issues. I'm a little bit afraid about that because in the end, we live in a democratic society. So decision has to have some kind of democratic legitimacy in order to be sustainable, as I see. Good. Let me say briefly that I agree with Thomas' uh, the description of the situation in Sweden. It is very much the same in Finland. Unfortunately, only worse. And Nikolai, what do you like? Oh, I just think is I fully actually agree with what's been said about uh, the break in contacts uh, between Nordic countries and Russia. Uh, I think it was a mistake, well, an understandable mistake, or else. I don't try to blame. It's an understandable mistake, but. A mistake, nonetheless, to make the sanctions so total. Uh, uh, basically, helping Russia to build uh, the Iron Curtain. Uh, when Finland closed the border to Russians, uh, I actually thought, goodness, they're playing, uh, they're playing the Putin game. Uh, well, it was quite obvious that the Russian government was provoking Finland to close the border. It's in Finland very happily actually did that. Uh, so uh, the isolation, the isolation of the human level, uh, ban on travel, uh, sanctions on private businesses. I'm not talking about the Russian state. I'll use for the state money. I'm talking about private. All that actually helps uh, uh, to strengthen the Iron Curtain. And uh, well, if the intention was that try to follow what's happening in Russia, so, so if the intention was that by, uh, say, banning travel to Europe, the Russian middle class who is used to travel to Europe uh, will turn against Putin. That was a mistake. Uh, yes, they blame Putin, but they also blame Europe. Uh, so, uh, yes, I would say the effect was actually exactly the opposite or so what was intended, but frankly, I don't know how uh, to change that now because I don't really see uh, any support whatsoever uh, for establishing uh, communication with experts or just with uh, uh, kind of uh, General in the public is in human in human relations. So uh, I'm afraid that here we are like lost uh, for some time. Uh, well, I think it's important to also understand what's happening in Russia. Well, I guess Putin is not forever. Um, I would, however, uh, suggest. Well, that's my impression. Uh, that when he leaves, if there is a free and democratic election in Russia, uh, the likely winner will be someone 
who pursues uh, less, much less actually repressive policy inside Russia, but whose foreign policy will be largely the same. Uh, and that's for a free election. Uh, uh, so I think I'll, 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 that's also one of the reasons why I'm not actually very optimistic about uh, of the prospect of peace building um, and good relationship. And I think we're in it for a long game and we need to try very, very, very hard to avoid actually conflicts and crises where none are intended just by mistake or emotion or something like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Keo Thomas, would you like to say something to this or survey proceed? Uh, regarding uh, civilian societies again, uh, or I think I, uh, I don't think I have anything more to say about that, uh, even though I agree with both Erki and Nikolai that it was a mistake uh, to not continue the dialogue with Russia. And I've been myself involved in several uh, projects uh, run by the Swedish organization in cooperation with other countries' organizations to collaborate with Russian universities in non-proliferation issues, setting up courses, uh, organizing summer schools, and so on, so on and so forth together. And um, I think it was a mistake to stop uh, those uh, uh, activities uh, because, uh, as Nikolai put it, it will be the day after Putin. And uh, then I think it is important to have networks, have contacts uh, with Russia. Uh, and I think uh, we shouldn't just shut the door uh, because we need uh, to understand what's going on. We need information. We need to have this dialogue going on. Having said that, of course, it's easy to say it's hard for practical reasons to carry out in real life because it's a political dimension involved here uh, uh, on both sides, both in Russia and in, in my country. If we talk about uh, a representative from the Nordic sphere, um, to be a little bit skeptical about this, to send kind of political signals. Okay, thank you. Eric. My point was that we should do the work of Putin because Putin is, one the, is the one who wants to cut off his uh, civil society from the West. So we should be help, helping him in that. Uh, but it is increasingly difficult. As a historian, one of the organizations which uh, has been very important uh, and a cooperation partner has been Memorial. Uh, which is now banned in Russia. And it has led uh, the deteriorating internal development in Russia has led to a growing diaspora of Russians uh, living in uh, the Nordic countries and other Western countries. And uh, we should also want to and try to engage with this uh, diaspora uh, and help them to build the conditions for a post put in Russia. Uh, and uh, I will mention that the Historians Without Borders, which I'm chairing, is is hoping to start a, a project uh, uh, bringing together historians from the Nordic countries and uh, from Russia uh, to discuss uh, the what was um, actually mentioned by Galtung already in his introductory remark, the unrecognized uh, traumas uh, of the past. And that is a problem that uh, many countries have, uh, and it is only Germany which has uh, has shown the best example of dealing with its awful past with this process of Vergangenheitsbewältigung. But there has been no Vergangenheitsbewältigung in in Russia, and sometimes it has been lacking in the Western countries too, and continues to be room for improvement in that respect. But that is one uh, uh, item we need to be able to address in the future, because unless we address 
uh, and find a common understanding of history and, and past history from, from all the countries involved, we are not going to have any sustainable peace because history can run, return as a zombie to haunt you uh, if you do not address it honestly and openly. And we see that how history has been used also in the uh, war against Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Putin's uh, uh, interpretations of history are very far uh, fetched from a Ukrainian and indeed any other point of view. So we historians without borders have managed twice before the war started in 22 uh, to bring together uh, historians from Ukraine and Russia uh, to discuss how to remove history being used as an item in, in conflicts between the two countries. Obviously, it is not possible to continue this kind of dialogue while uh, the conflict and the war goes on. But uh, uh, we have received uh, notices uh, and opinions from both sides, from the Ukrainian and Russian side, that once this becomes uh, again possible, uh, we should also try to engage in, in this kind of facilitation between historians. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, finally, I would like to ask you one more question. How do you summarize the insights produced by this discussion? Could I direct this question first to Nikolai and then Erki and then Thomas? I don't think it's for me to summarize the discussion. <laughs> I think the audience should summarize the discussion for themselves. I would say that uh, we see a lot of divergence uh, uh, in perspectives in the East and the West. I think that we're in for a difficult kind of period. Uh, we lost a lot of voice gained, even during the Cold War, and especially in the last years of the Cold War and the first years after. I think we need all to critically reassess uh, was everything we did right. I do think there were mistakes made uh, not just on the Russian side. Uh, I don't question the motivations of people uh, who made these decisions, uh, but in the long term, they turned out to be not optimal. Uh, we, I think, should understand what happened, and uh, uh, we should be prepared or to make the second round actually better. I think the second round is good. Uh, uh, what I would suggest is that I fully agree that Nordic countries have an enormous, probably one of the biggest actually in the world political and moral capital for peace building. Because I understand that the public and the political kind of environment right now in Nordic countries is not very conducive towards oh, oh, these efforts, but something tells me that it will be there soon. Uh, and uh, I think we should try, well, especially you, of course, yes, I'm not in Nordic country now, uh, but it's important to try to preserve uh, that legacy of to preserve that capacity, is going to work maybe very quietly uh, to rebuild it. Uh, and uh, we do have opportunities. Uh, I fully agree about history. I fully agree about the civil society kind of relations uh, and everything. Well, it's good that, uh, that we have the internet uh, so it's more actually difficult to build. Uh, oh, I'm an iron curtain actually nowadays. Uh, uh, some context can still be actually kept and preserved and developed. Uh, so we should try doing that. I, I am pessimistic in the sense that I think the current situation will take a long time. But I'm optimistic in the sense that we don't have an alternative. 
uh, to stability and uh, to an effort to rebuild the relationship because it ultimately is it's about the future of Europe, it's about the future of the world. And if, about the comment about Trump, uh, I, I didn't vote for Trump last time, I won't vote for him this time, <laughs> but uh, I will not be too scared about it. There's a question actually in the chat, uh, which goes, in case Trump is elected in November in the US and wants to leave NATO or reduce the US involvement, what will happen to the Nordic region? Um, I don't think it will, nothing dramatic will happen immediately, but it will help us to focus on European cooperation. Uh, and because I have always stressed that for Finland's security, uh, our number one partner is, has been and will be Sweden, because of all the world's countries, Sweden is the one which has the, its most uh, uh, prominent uh, own interest in the security of Finland. Then come the other Nordic countries, and then comes Europe. And it's very fine if the Americans all have an interest in uh, securing uh, Finnish uh, uh, Finland, uh, but uh, uh, I wouldn't count on it too much. So we shouldn't be too blue-eyed. So uh, the election of Trump will provide a, an uh, important uh, impetus for uh, concentrating on building up a stronger European uh, identity, stronger European defense, uh, and stronger European strategic autonomy, which actually the rest of the world would welcome if we, if we were able to do so. So. Uh, that was actually the case already eight years ago when Trump was first elected. It helped wonderfully focus um, the, the, uh, our ideas on working in the European Union, uh, uh, and uh, so did actually Brexit. So the European Union and become stronger through these kind of crisis situations, and certainly the election of Trump will present a crisis for for all of us. Um, and then as uh, how to summarize the discussion, that's almost in mission impossible. Uh, so I will just point out that uh, I think the most important message coming out of the party discussion has been the need for dialogue uh, with all parties, all partners, and the need for Nordic uh, continued Nordic active uh, initiatives and involvement in uh, peace building processes and disarmament, arms control, etc. Thank you. Thank you. And Thomas. Yeah, I think it's very important uh, to ask ourselves, and now I'm talking about uh, Sweden and probably also Finland as new members of NATO, because the reasons for joining NATO is to increase the security for our country. At the same time, we don't know what will happen in the future in terms of what the NATO enlargement will lead to. It's a dynamic that we probably don't really understand right now because it's a very dynamic and complex situation going on. Uh, and I think because of that, I think uh, seminars like this, discussions like this, where we kind of are open for different perspectives are so important. Uh, because, I mean, what is NATO enlargement? What kind of uh, was the driving force behind it? I mean, you could argue it's a kind of natural process in terms of based on object objective historical facts. Yeah, you can argue like that. But on the other hand, I would say it's also a process driven by different interpretation different perception of what should be done and what is needed. And we, ha we have to understand uh, from a Nordic point of view, if we kind of uh, try to see this from a Nordic uh, perspective, what's going on in Russia, how the Russians view the situation, uh, uh, what is happening? Uh, because it could be, be argued like, yes, uh, it's uh, fully correct and uh, legally right to join NATO, of course. Uh, you, 
you don't have to kind of argue for a rule-based order there. But uh, there is also important to kind of discuss uh, what is um, wise and uh, productive uh, change and movement. Uh, could this process have been done in a different way? I'm not saying I have an answer for this, but I think we have to be open for try to see what the other side uh, are, how they view the situation. Uh, so I, I, yes, very much I, I would say we need a dialogue uh, and not just uh, find ourselves in our own black box, so to see, uh, and just continue it. Uh, and, and that goes back to what we discussed earlier during this discussion, that um, a dialogue is so important. Collaboration uh, is important. And that's what I take from this uh, kind of discussion and, um, and that we can continue and, and sit down and try to yeah, see what's going on, so to speak, okay. and learn from it. Thank you. We have now reached the end of the discussion, and I would like to thank you all for your valuable contributions. It has been a great pleasure to be here today. And the discussion raised many interesting and fresh thoughts on this crucially important topic. I also want to thank the audience for their participation. There's certainly a lot to think about for all of us. And something to practice, starting from this empathy highlighted by Professor Carlton in the video. I want to give a special thanks to Presence and International Press Agency, especially Mr. David Anderson, for all the support that made this event possible. A link to the recording of this conversation will be published on Presence's website, and we would certainly like to share it widely. And I would like to say thank you once again to all our distinguished panelists, Mr. Erk Tuomioja, Professor Thomas Jonter, and senior fellow Nikolai Soko. Thank you and happy spring to you all.